Number 10, twins named Jim. Okay, we'll kick this part two off on a lighter note. This one gets a little dark, so we'll ease our way in, you know? The twins named Jim. Okay, that sounds like a 2026 comedy hit already. Back in 1979, a set of twins were reunited when they were 39 years old at the time. This was, of course, a big moment in their lives. For 37 years, they barely knew of each other's existence. Then when they finally met, the long lost twins had more in common than they could have ever thought. For starters, both had been named Jim. I spoiled that in the fun title earlier, but their adoptive parents both named the lads Jim. That's insane. Jim? Like of all names, really? And both Jims just happened to love math and carpentry. Both also had jobs and security, and both also had ex-wives named Linda. And they both since married a woman named Betty. This is incredible. This isn't like, what? Imagine meeting another you, and he's like, oh yeah, I also love knitting and Autobots. What are the odds? No, that's too eerie. You're an alien clone. Something's afoot here. Get out of here. Not just meeting a long lost twin at 40. No way. Number nine, legendary musical neighbors. It's weird how similar some of your neighbors are, right? Like growing up, we had three Davids on our street. They all loved cutting their lawn at 7 a.m. What a coincidence, right? We all hated them. What a coincidence. Well, the 60s rock icon, Jimi Hendrix, and the 18th century composer, George Frederick Handel, they were both neighbors. A couple hundred years apart, but they were both neighbors indeed. They lived in 23 Brook Street and 25 Brook Street in London. What are the odds, right? Had George had been born 200 years later, we would have gotten the greatest collab of all time. Yeah, if you're local, of course you'll know there's a site there now, it's a famous landmark, but in terms of coincidences, there's music in the air on Brock Street, something's going on. Kinda wanna walk by and see if I'm better at playing the, playing the flute. Maybe I can play the flute on that block, who knows. Number eight, same taxi, different tragedy. Okay, here's a dark one, buckle up folks. Pun intended. Back in 1975, a man was sadly hit by a taxi in Bermuda. Now, he of course sadly did not make it. All the while, a passenger in the taxi witnessed the entire horrible event. Now that's life changing in itself, that's trauma, right? A year later though, the same driver was driving the same passenger when all of a sudden, the taxi hits another civilian. That civilian just happened to be the initial victim's brother. Ugh, horrible. This is some Final Destination stuff. I don't like it at all. Like this, what are the odds here, really? Let's move on to something a bit nicer, a bit. Number seven, same day, different vows. Okay, brightening up the mood a little bit, bringing us all back to happy land. CBC News reported this one. It's a little nicer of an ending. Fred and Lynette Dubendorf, husband and wife, they were taking a stroll down the beach with their dog, living up the life, right, the classic, when they noticed a message in a bottle had washed up on the shore. Now, personally, I wouldn't be too excited, right? I'd be a little concerned. I've seen Castaway, you know? This message could go one of two ways. I have no idea. Like, what's gonna be in here, right? Like, help, 1876, you're like, oh no. But they opened it, and inside they found wedding vows from another couple, Melody Kloska and Matt Bears. They had recently got married on a beach in Lake Michigan, and word spread rather quickly. Thing is, their wedding date was the same as the couple who found the message. That was the bizarre coincidence here. So they took it as a sign that both pairs were meant to be, and they sent a surprising letter to the lost couple's address. It's kinda nice, but it's also kinda creepy, you know? It'd be creepy on one hand. Hey, I found that message in a bottle. Cool, nice address, lovely home. Cool, I'll be back in a bit, hope it works out. Who puts their address on a message? That's just asking for disaster. Number six, one dollar marriage. The story of Esther and Paul Gratchen. Okay, this one goes out to all the single folks out there, okay? Keep hanging on. Love's coming, it's out there. See, Paul had decided on asking Esther to marry him, and around the same time, he caught himself about to spend a $1 bill on a sandwich. But the dollar bill randomly had the name Esther on it, okay? So he framed it, obviously this was a bizarre coincidence, and Paul recognized this. And when he showed Esther later, she was speechless, right? She loved it, but she didn't tell Paul her side of the story until after they tied the knot. See, much earlier, when Esther and a group of friends were all going through a breakup, they wrote their names on a dollar bill and said, whoever brings this Bill back to them, they'll marry that man. Now Esther didn't tell Paul the full story until after they got married because, well, she was worried this coincidence would have scared him away. Yeah, more than fair. Hey, I have a dollar bill and it's your name on it, so we have to get married now. You're like, what? Bye. Number five, Civil War coincidence. There's another war coincidence in this list, but I saved that for number one, because it's too good. But this one here is also pretty insane. The Civil War began in 1861 with the first battle of Bull Run. The Bull Run is a stream that passes through the farm of a 46 year old Wilmer McLean. Passes through his farm, right? The Bull Run is a stream that passes through the farm of a 46 year old Wilmer McLean. This property was in Virginia. Now, of course, once the dust settled, the property was destroyed. So McLean left his home with his wife. And for nearly four years, the pair were considered safe while the war was otherwise changing history. Then in 1865, the war came to a close when Robert E. Lee surrendered 
surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the Apotomax Courthouse, which at the time was literally steps away from McLean's new property. Yeah, he saw the beginning and the end of the Civil War by accident. He saw it front row too, what are the odds? Number four, George D. Bryson. Back in the 50s, this story was spread all over Kentucky. Back in the 50s in Louisville, a man named George D. Bryson was checking into a hotel room. Now he walked up and asked if there was any mail for him, which on one hand is an excellent bit. I'm gonna do that next time I go to a hotel for sure. Hey, got any mail? Classic, cause you're just visiting the one time. There's no way there's gonna be mail. That's the joke, right? Except this time there was. This time the hotel manager said yes. And there was in fact mail from the previous occupant of the room who had also had the same name, George D. Bryson. Yeah, what are the odds, right? I remember one time I met another McWaters and he was not related to me. And he also was not thrilled that we had the same name at all. It was the most bizarre thing. I was like, hey, can we talk about this? He's like, yeah, cool. I'm like, are you my brother? Let's, I don't want you to be anymore. Get out of here. Then I got Kyle and I was like, you know what? Change your name. Now you're my new brother. Replace this guy. Number three, Yanni and Laurel. Before we wrap up this curious list, we have to throw a fun recent one in as well. Remember this Yanni Laurel thing back in 2018? I only heard Yanni for like two weeks straight. I heard Yanni. That's it. For two weeks, guaranteed. I was determined that it was Yanni, okay? And then one day I listened and it was Laurel. And then I couldn't go back. It was just Laurel all of a sudden. Like it immediately just changed. It was a completely different word. I felt sick. I was like, is this real life? How is this happening? This got everybody talking. What is this phenomenon that happens? Same with the dress mishap. What is going on? Well, many believe these viral illusions are proof that we're living in a simulation. Yeah, these arguments, you know, the dress is blue, no, it's white. These situations prove that we perceive reality in our own individual way. Everybody is living an individual perceived reality. So sometimes it doesn't always align. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear. Sometimes we hear Zami, and then sometimes we hear Laurel, and it's completely different for some reason. I can't go back now, it's the worst. God, I hated this so much. The dress was back in 2015, then Yanni Laurel was 2018. I don't know, we're due for another glitch in the matrix any day now. I come back next week, I have a different first name all of a sudden, you're like, what? Number two, Miss Unsinkable. It's one thing to narrowly miss a natural disaster or a massive accident, but to not miss a tragedy three times in a row, that sounds like a curse, if you ask me. That's for sure a curse. Violet Jessup, this brave soul, survived three major ship disasters in history. She was born in 1887 in Argentina, and Jessup contracted tuberculosis at a young age and wasn't expected to live longer than a few months. She beat those odds and lived a healthy, relatively long life, which is shocking considering what I'm about to tell you. Violet, first of all, had a hard time getting hired as a stewardess on a ship because her youth and good looks were feared to distract crew and passengers. Yeah, you're too good looking to work on a ship. Welcome to the 1900s, I guess. Eventually, she got hired in 1910 to work aboard the HMS Olympic. Now, a year later, the Olympic collided with HMS Hawk and the ship barely made it to shore. It was a tragedy, it was a huge disaster. Violet then served as a nurse aboard the Britannic right before World War I. The ship then collided with a German mine and Violet jumped overboard and somehow survived with a fractured skull in the water and swam to safety. Afterwards, Violet worked on the Titanic and on April 14th, 1912, she escaped another disaster on lifeboat 16. I mean, like the odds that you survive three times in a row is one thing, but to experience three of those in a row? Huh. And finally, number one, World War I soldiers. We have to finish on a grim note because this one is one of the most bizarre, in my opinion. When the First World War ended, the amount of British lives lost were around one million souls. The first reported casualty of World War I was a soldier named John Parr. And then after a countless number of lives were lost, the last soldier to die was a man named George Edwin Ellison. Now both heroes, resting places, are both in the St. Symphorian Military Cemetery, and they just happened to be 15 feet apart. And of course, this was not planned, nor were any of the entries on our list. It's just another bizarre coincidence that was discovered after the fact. At number 10, we have the Fermi Paradox. This theory has some holes, but it is still very interesting so it was a perfect way to start out this list. We live in a universe that spans an unfathomable distance and has so many planets in them, you couldn't count them even if you were really good at counting. So, some of them are much older than ours, so that means that their life would be way more advanced. So why on earth have we never heard of any of these aliens? Why have they not come out of the stars to see us? Well, this could be because we have a government that is hiding them from us, or it could be because we are in a simulated world and there's no benefit to simulating life on other planets. That could mean that the processing power and whatever we're hooked up to just isn't strong enough. We need to get a rig that is way better if we wanted some alien life to come in. We've got to invest on in a new like graphics card and stuff. Number nine, Stephen Hawking's. Time is relative and fascinating and 
all that confusing stuff. There's so many components of our universe that we still don't even understand. James Webb is out here making people turn to atheists all of a sudden. The universe is bigger than we all think, yet somehow it still gives us these once in a lifetime coincidences. Or as I say, Stephen Hawking's death occurred on Einstein's 139th birthday, which is also Galileo's 300th death day, and also Pi Day. This was March 14th. My dad has the same birthday as Daniel Radcliffe, and they're both wizards, so I don't know. Just saying. These birthday coincidences are getting out of hand. Coincidences, coincidences, coincidences. There it is, he's got it. Number eight, atomic survivor. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two nuclear explosives over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This, of course, was devastating. The results in this reaction, the blast and the radiation they both caused, took the lives of nearly 90,000 people. It was horrible. But in 2009, the Japanese government confirms that there was at least one man who was in each city on both both days of the reactions, and he lived to tell the tale. On August 6th, Satamu Yamaguchi was in Hiroshima on a business trip. As I was walking alone, I heard the sound of a plane. Just one, he told a British newspaper. I looked up into the sky and I saw the B-29 and it dropped two parachutes. I was looking up into the sky at them and suddenly it was like a flash of magnesium, a great flash in the sky, and I was blown over just like that. And by August 9th, he had returned home to Nagasaki only to experience the trauma for a second time. Despite the double radiation exposure, Yamaguchi lived to be 93 years old, which is incredible. He sadly passed away from stomach cancer. Number seven, Julianne Kopka. Miss Julianne has a two for one when it comes to survival stories. I had to include it. Her story starts out on Christmas Eve, a lovely day, 1971, when she was just a teenager and she was on Lanza Flight 508. Now the plane was struck by lightning, which is an actual nightmare situation that I didn't know could happen. And this led to the plane starting to disintegrate midair. I don't even, yeah. It was all bad. In what felt like the blink of an eye for Julianne, she found herself still strapped to her seat two miles above the Peruvian rainforest. She was injured, of course, full of bruises, a broken collarbone, but she was alive after she landed. And in fact, she was the only person who had been on the flight that was still alive. Just fell out of a plane and lived to tell. That is crazy. That is bad insane. But it's like you're out of the fire into the frying pan at this point, right? Now you're in the wilderness all alone with no food. Just, you know, a little bit of candy, if anything, from the plane. Julianne had found a small stream which she began to wade in downstream. She traveled along it. And the insects in the jungle were eating her alive. And sorry, this next part is gross, but maggots had infected her arm. It was like bad, worse, even worse. Now we're flowing down a river and maggots are eating me. This is incredible. Julianne ended up coming across a sort of encampment where she found a few supplies and she was so smart and was able to give herself a little bit of first aid, which included pouring gasoline on the infected arm, which then led to all the you know disgusting bugs and maggots leaving it. Because they're like, hey, I'm not a fan of gasoline. Lunch is over. See you later. And then just a few hours later, a few lumber workers found her. And they gave her more first aid treatment and took her to an area that was more populated, where she was then airlifted for medical treatment. Now, in 2000, her story was told through the documentary titled Wings of Hope, which was directed by Werner Herzog, who particularly took interest in the story because, one, it's obviously incredible as I was just explaining it. I read this and I'm like, it's crazy. But two, Werner Herzog also had a seat booked on that flight and he would have been on that same flight if it wasn't for a last minute change of plans. I can't even, that should be number one, really. Number six, Comet family. Okay, this one's good. The odds of being hit or killed by a meteor are one in two million or something like that, right? It's crazy. But even so, back in 1954, residents in Talladega County, Alabama, noticed a ball of fire heading towards the earth. Now, back then we didn't have Twitter, right? We couldn't warn anybody that a meteor was possibly gonna hit us. We also really didn't know if it was gonna hit or not or how big it was, so it was alarming. Especially for Anne Elizabeth Hodges, who got hit by said space rock. Yeah, she only got grazed, but with these odds, it's still possible, wild. Now cut to recent history, the Comet family in France. Their house was hit by a meteor. I'll say that again. The Comet family was hit by a, you get it, there we go. As somebody with the last name McWaters, I'm a little worried that I might drown now. I don't know, last names seem to be a little bit of a tip off. It seems. And number five, World Cup. An episode from The Simpsons back in 1997 called The Cartridge Family shows Mexico and Portugal going head to head in football. Like, you know, like soccer football, not like, you know, football, football, you get it. Springfield residents are told to go see this match to determine which nation is the greatest on earth, Mexico or Portugal. So when the 2018 World Cup then rolled around much later, rolled around, pun intended, Fans were excited that this was now coming true, but at the same time, had a laugh determining that Ronaldo must have missed that penalty intentionally so that the prediction would come true. That's like the theory now, that Ronaldo missed 
to make The Simpsons correct. A lot of theories for that one, it's always fun. But recently it's been announced that Qatar will host a tournament in November and December 2022, rather than usual June, July dates. Another World Cup, another chance for The Simpsons to add another prediction to their already impressive list. That's a creepy show. I have another Simpsons one coming up, but we'll see. Number four, Mars Life. Eh, we're back, there it is. There's the next Simpson one, that, that fast, there we go. Let me ask you lovely people a question. If you could go to Mars right now with like three of your friends, would you do it? Keep in mind it's really boring, and unless you're a astronaut botanist like Matt Damon, you'll probably have a rough go. But in the future, would you do it? I would, I'd go. I'd go with like one person, you know? Force too many, that's too much. Going to Mars might be as simple as going to the mall. Apparently, The Simpsons have an episode where they show a family visit to the big red planet come 2051. But honestly, I feel like we're gonna get there a lot sooner. SpaceX is already planning to send people out there. It's a quick, you know, nine month trip, so make sure your phone's charged. But it's actually more beneficial for the team to travel during these peak times, in the 2030s and in the 2050s. Because during these years, trips to the planet will be shorter and they'll coincide with periods of the solar maximum. So while this one may or may not come true in 2022, well, let me tell you, it's right around the corner. Or maybe in 2050. Who knows? Number three, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. And you're probably thinking, eh, what could possibly be worrisome or, you know, creepy about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that fateful day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, and for some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and now she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. The eerie part is, you can see See the word majestic was crossed out on her card, which then shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and they could have somehow warned her. That's the creepy thing about these coincidences. Sometimes they're just bad, you know? You could fall out of a plane and have maggots all over you and survive, or you could go from one cursed ship to another. Ah, number two, Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, this is a story that actually convinced me that Edgar Allan Poe is for real a time traveler, so buckle up, grab a soda. Because two separate stories that he wrote both turned out to be exceptionally true and real, but not until after they'd been written. Yeah, it's a good one. Firstly, Poe's only completed novel was published in 1838, and it tells the tale of mutiny on a whaling ship lost at sea. These men on a ship realize that they're doomed and need to resort to extreme measures in order to stay alive. So they begin drawing straws to see who they're going to sacrifice to save food. A boy named Richard Parker drew the shortest straw and therefore became the next meal. Dark, let's move on. Let's fast forward to 46 years now to 1884, and in real life also, I might add. There are now four men who have been set adrift after the sinking of a yacht. These men found themselves in a similar predicament to the novels, and I kid you not, they ended up taking the same route and elected to sacrifice a cabin boy. A cabin boy also named Richard Parker. Odd, right? Okay. Cut to 1840, Poe penned the gruesome story, The Businessman, in which the narrator suffers a traumatic head injury in his youth, and then later a violent life follows. The weird thing about this story is that Edgar Allan Poe fully understood, or so it seemed, frontal lobe injury. Now this was long before it was ever even studied or looked at, right? This this type of study didn't arrive until 1848. An actual neurologist, Eric Altschuler, recently wrote how there's a dozen symptoms and he knew every single one. It's so exact and it's so weird, it's like he had a time machine, end quote. Yeah, it's almost like he had a time machine. Did he? And finally, number one, Simpsons dome in real life. Yep, yeah, this one's gonna hit home, let's do it. This one's gonna hit dome. That didn't work. For this one, we're looking at the Simpsons movie, which still holds up. That's a fun time. But even over the pandemic, I saw personal domes come to life, right? It was so weird. Restaurants were making these like weird tents on sidewalks just to stay in business. But an even bigger idea came long before this. Back in the 70s, there were talks about putting a dome over Manhattan, this massive dome over Midtown that regulates weather and pollution, all that good stuff. Now, if that had been built, imagine what we would have done with it during the initial breakout during this pandemic. It would have been madness. And then in 2010, later on, the city called Eco City 2020 was planned out. It was supposed to be built in Siberia. It was announced in 2014 officially, this climate controlled, you know, domed city, four and a half square kilometers, all that good stuff. But since 2016, the project lost the funding. What do you guys think? Should we bring back domes and just, you know, have a, a little personal bubble everywhere we go? Just lose the umbrella and live in a big glass ball forever over our city? 
I'd do it, that'd be kind of nice. Be like living in a Coca-Cola mist zone your entire life, just kind of like, ooh, this is nice. Kick you off the list at number 10, the Hoover Dam coincidence. We'll kick this list off on a grim note, because why not? The Hoover Dam, okay, this massive accomplishment. Its first victim, sadly, was a man named J.G. Tierney. It was December 20th, 1922, and the official death toll from industrial accidents during the construction of the dam from 1921 to 1935 was sadly around the 200 number. It was a lot of deaths, so it was pretty sad. The earliest and latest victims of the construction were both father and son. And if that's not coincidence enough, both of them died on the exact same day. They both passed on December 20th. J.G. Tierney sadly drowned while conducting surveys in the Colorado River, and then 13 years later, Patrick Tierney fell off an intake tower right before construction was complete. Grim start, but... Stay tuned, we have a lot more. At number nine, we have the Mandela Effect. You might have heard of this. This is where people misremember something from the past. Now, people misremembering things happens all the time. What's the big deal? But the Mandela Effect is literally thousands of people remembering it a different way. It's called the Mandela Effect because there are thousands of people, maybe even millions, who remember Nelson Mandela dying in the 80s. But he didn't die in the 80s. This dude lived until he was an old man. Or am I remembering it wrong? Are the other people right? The reason why this could be proof of a simulation is because these slight mistakes could show some sort of human error or a glitch in the system on the side of the people who are running the simulation. Someone sat down on the wrong button and was like, oh, I killed Nelson Mandela. I'm gonna get written up for this for sure. God damn, that wasn't supposed to happen. At number eight, we have Deja Vu. If you haven't seen The Matrix, then what are you doing with your life? It's not only one of the most amazing movies that showcases what could happen if AI gets out of control, but it also is one of the greatest action movies of all time. And there's a fourth one coming, so you need to catch up on everything. Now, The Matrix was one of the first movies to showcase the simulation idea. And evidence of The Matrix, or something changing in The Matrix, was deja vu. If you saw something repeat itself, it meant that you were in the simulation and that things were about to get crazy. Now, how does this translate to the real world? What if The Matrix wasn't so much a movie, but it was a message? What if the people outside of the simulation wanted us to figure it out and see if any people would use the hints laid throughout the movie as a way to actually break free from this digital prison. There could be clues throughout that movie that showcase all the signs of us being in a world of ones and zeros. Either that, I'm starting to look like Charlie from It Was Always Sunny with the strings and paper, and I'm like, hey. At number seven, we have simulation loop. We are already starting to see what is called a simulation loop. We live in a simulated society. Many things we create are larger versions of smaller things. Planes are simulations of birds. Tanks are simulations of beetles. As we create what we think is better versions of what already exists. Now we could be getting close to a loop of creating a world which is more interesting than our own. Virtual reality has started to take the world by storm and in it we will build worlds that are far more superior to our own. Worlds where people can fly, everyone is rich, you don't get sick and everyone can res their buddy because they got the ray gun. Now some people theorize that we have done this before and we are currently living in a previously created simulation and we might be headed into another loop in the near future and go into a simulation again. So it's like simulation on simulation. Inception, in simulation. No, I'm not gonna work on that. I made that word up, I'm sorry. At number six, we have the double slit experiment. This was an experiment where you take a panel of copper plate with two slits in it and then you fire electrons at it to see how the electrons interact on the other side. Do they move through in waves or particles? The first time this experiment was performed, the electrons seemed as though they were moving through in particles. The scientists wanted to see this in action, so they set up a device to observe this. And when the electrons were under observation, they moved in waves. So they did the test again without the observation and they went back to particles, meaning that the electrons would change how they interacted based on whether or not they were being observed. If this was a simulation, much like a video game, the processing power would increase on certain areas when you were looking at them, which would explain how this changed the electron activity. Obviously, it's probably a lot smarter explanation than that, but I'm going with the simulation one because I am not smart. At number five, we have Elon Musk said so, come on, you can't argue with this dude. He's one of the smartest, richest people around. If anyone knew we were in a simulation, it would be this guy. He probably sees the matrix all the time. He just doesn't want to freak us out by letting us know that there is a 100% chance we are in a simulation by letting us know that there's a 100% chance we are in a simulation. Also, if anyone was on the up and up on whether or not we are in a simulation, it would be billionaires. Not because they paid someone to figure it out, but because they clearly have cracked some sort of code and know how the world works and are doing something we don't understand 
understand. If you had that kind of knowledge, you would be able to get ahead in the game. But Elon has made the theory of a simulation world so popular, so is he our digital messiah, or is he just a little bit crazy and has a lot of money? And number four, we have that's why we have ghosts. Now this seems like I'm trying to explain a myth with a crazy explanation, but that is why you guys come here. We want to get a little crazy with our theories because that is way more fun. Just walking around in our own reality, we don't want to do that, jeez. But what if ghosts and hauntings have nothing to do with ghosts, but they are glitchy parts of our own reality? Like a haunted house is just basically Fallout 76. Ghosts are floating around doing the T pose, freaking everyone out. Demons, werewolves, all that sort of spooky stuff that we've always heard about. Myths, monsters, and creatures that could all kill us. That's just DLC that the public didn't like and then they just patched it out. And number three, we have creative purpose theory. Why do we exist? Some people think it's to serve God. Other people think it's just to have fun. Other people think there is no purpose at all. That we just live and die to get farted out into the earth and never heard from again. But what if we had a much greater purpose? To create. To make something so smart and so interesting we couldn't bear to compete with it. As we get closer and closer to making AI, it seems that a self-aware, learning, adapting intelligence that has the power of the internet in its mind would be too much for us to compete with. It would be a living god that we made and we should be pretty proud of ourselves for doing it. But what if that is our purpose? To make a being that is all knowing and able to move through the universe, consume knowledge and become even more powerful all without needing to eat, sleep, procreate or even take breaks. What if we already did this and now we're living inside this endless machine and the only reason it keeps us alive in this falsified world is because it wants to keep learning from us. Well, if that's the case, download me some abs because it's almost beach season. And number two, we have computer viruses for people. DNA is a type of code, much like the code that makes up computers. So could a virus from a computer get into someone's DNA somehow? Most of you probably think that is impossible, but there was a group at the University of Washington who might prove you wrong. Now, I want to start off by saying you can't get sick from a computer. The virus that got put into human DNA cannot affect people. Don't freak out. But in 2017, this group found out that you could put malware into a strand of DNA. It was a very interesting experiment and it might have worked because all of our DNA is actually code and we are actually made up of ones and zeros and nothing's real. Ah, go rob someone. Don't actually do that. And for our number one spot, we have the Fibonacci sequence. This is gonna be some math stuff, so if you guys aren't good at math, don't worry, because I suck at math too, and I had to find a dumbed down explanation so I could understand it, and I'm gonna be bringing you an even dumber version right out of my mouth. The Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers where the totals equal the numbers before added together. So starting with zero, we have zero plus one equals one. One plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, three plus five equals eight, and so on and so forth, with the sequence looking like zero, one, one, two, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and it goes on like that forever. Now, what does this have to do with simulation? Well, this sequence shows up in a lot of math and also a lot of nature. Many plants and other natural forming things have perfect Fibonacci sequences inside of them, almost like they were programmed from a computer. This could just be the most efficient way to make life and cells are living math, or could we all be in an auto create version of life and that's how the world is built in a computer and it's just like boop they hit a button and it makes everything. Mm -hmm.